I met Bo Buchanan almost 50 years ago when we were both students of a remarkable New York City businessman who was also a meditation teacher. He was affectionately known as Rudy. He became Swami Rudrananda. And Bo was a student of Rudy's for the last 50 years. Bo was a very uh, complicated rock and roll guy back in the early days of the late 60s. He was a really thick-skinned, very driven person who you, was really the last person you would imagine to be someone to meditate or to benefit from meditation. But he fell so totally in love with Rudy and with what Rudy had to offer that he blossomed and grew in ways that were, I think, the most beautiful demonstration of what Rudy was as a teacher and what somebody could be as a student. His work with Rudy over the course of the years Rudy was alive were really interesting to watch because there was a great deal of tension and drama and struggle, but there was so much belief and effort. And then tragedy. Rudy was killed in a plane crash and Bo was the pilot. And that absolute horrific moment became the defining element in Bo's life. And he had to live for the rest of his life knowing that he had been responsible for the death of the person he most loved. And that could have been such a tragic ending for Bo, let alone for Rudy. And yet Bo used this really powerful teaching to become who he is today somebody who understands a role he had to play in some giant, larger scheme of things. And he really came to be this person of great luminosity because he had to deal with such powerful, difficult forces and transcend them all. And Bo is a perfect example of what years of sitting quietly and meditating deeply can do for the human soul. I went to New York uh, in about 68, into 68, 69, and um, Mimi took me in to her house, and uh, she was studying with Rudy, and had been for a long time, and I wanted to be able to share that. So I wasn't really looking for a teacher. I was, wasn't in any means looking for a teacher as was Bruce, for example. Um, I went there because I wanted to share that. And Rudy just took me in and loved me and nourished me and pretty much changed my life. Not in a flash or anything that was uh, overnight by any means. And I remained thick and stubborn and and, um, but he just loved me and <sighs> helped me to grow. Could you describe your first meeting with him? Where, where did that take place and what, what you felt meeting him? And it was in his store, and, uh, which was on 4th Avenue around the corner from his house and ashram that was on 10th. And uh, I went in uh, by invitation, sat there with him in the store, and he gave me the introductory class and said to come to class. I just did it by rote. It was um, it didn't make any sense. Of course, the exercise intellectually is probably doesn't make any sense. But just doing it, and my motivation to do it was because I saw how it was working with Ru with Mimi, and um, I wanted to be able to share that. So over the years of doing it, and I had a lot of time to be with Rudy because I would drive him anywhere he wanted to go. Rudy didn't drive. I, I think he did before. 
I don't know if he got too many tickets or what, <laughs> but I, he didn't drive. And I just made myself available to take him anywhere. And uh, that worked out very well for me. I got to spend hours with him. And I felt like I was a rock sitting under a waterfall where much of what he would say, I had no idea. Had no idea of, of what it meant or what he was talking about. But I knew I had the good fortune to just sit there, be there. Rudy would say of himself that he was not special but he was always open, he's always available. And so when the gifts came, when the time came for there to be gifts, or he was just there. And that's why he got them. And I received so much because I was there. What do you feel was the, uh, the greatest gift that Rudy gave you? Well, Rudy gave me my life in every sense of the meaning. Um, in the crash, three of us walked away. Uh, we stayed in this life. The foundation of my life is the work. Um, That's the greatest gift, just knowing Rudy. Why is it, do you think, that you've found the inspiration and the discipline to continue this work for, what, something like four decades now? I don't think it's been four decades. Let's see. Well, I guess it is. <laughs> Amazing. Well, it's just one day at a time. It's not something that I ever would have believed or thought uh, or considered. It, it just happened one day at a time. Um, it's 40 years, or will be. And I, it's not something you set out, you don't set a goal and say, well, I'm gonna do this for 40 years or 60 years, or 10 years, or 100 years. I don't know if you even set out to say, I certainly didn't set out to say I was gonna do this for the rest of my life. Uh, that was not the plan. There really wasn't a plan. I just took it at the time, did it at the time, and found that it worked more than anything. And other support. Bruce has been very supportive. Bruce and Blanche are wonderful. Um, sweethearts. Rudy was tougher, you know, but not. Uh, Rudy could scold you so lovingly that. Um, to me, it wasn't like being scolded. I don't know even, well, sometimes he'd say, you know, don't be a schmuck. <laughs> sometimes he would, but not much, even though I was all the time. Uh, he worked very hard. I don't know anybody who ever worked as hard as Rudy and as constantly. And you know, he would say, if there's a harder way, show me. He really believed in suffering. And I questioned that. I said, Rudy, can't I do this and be, be easy with it? You know, can't, I, can't I grow from, from pleasure? And he said, well, if you can, Bo, that's fine, but 
I've always grown through suffering. I don't now feel that what he meant by that was suffering like being on the rack or tortured or deprived. It's more like just really feeling, being present, being aware. And um, because Rudy certainly had pleasures. As he said, sometimes um, when things go bad or the car breaks down and, and if you if you're fortunate, then it'll break down in front of a, um, an ice cream parlor or something. He had the students do a lot of work around the ashram in the early days. What was, what was it like being a part of that? Well, Rudy'd say that the one thing he never wanted to be accused of was not having work for people to do or not working them hard. I, uh, Rudy believed and showed us how important work was. If we had time to complain, we didn't have enough to do. That there was always something to do, and he opened and provided that. He didn't do for us in the sense of making us dependent or weak. He worked and was strong from working, and he made us strong from working. The, the work that we do, the spiritual work, is work. It's not really so much meditation. It's not mental. It's physical work. The double breath is physical work. It's spiritual work. Our spiritual muscles are worked and opened. We have to consciously do that, just like any exercise, like lifting weights. We grow from working. Rather than sitting around and, and talking about it, we'd say, get up and work. Do this, do that. He was a taskmaster because he took that responsibility for himself and for others. So when we got the place, or he got the place up in Big Indian, and there was a lot of work to do. <laughs> and Rather than looking at it a place to just take a vacation or lounge around and let the mosquitoes bite you, there was work to be done. And people learned from doing that work. People learned to be carpenters and plumbers and, and clean. And look around and be aware. If there was something on the ground that needed to be picked up, pick it up. This is your place. Rudy didn't need that place. Rudy would say, on this material level, that he was fine. He didn't have to struggle with that. He had that down. So he worked spiritually and believed that we should work spiritually and physically, that we should support ourselves, that that was an important part of spiritual growth to be able to live in this plane, to live in every sense how you are, where you are. How long have you been teaching Ruby's work and how did you start? Well, before I was a teacher, um, Rudy first of all made John Mann a teacher, I believe. And 
and then Stuart Parent and some others. And I once asked Rudy, well, when will I teach? And he said, well, you can teach right now if you want to teach what you know. It's, <laughs> um, so that quieted me right away. And then sometime after that, probably not too long after, I, he gave me the instructions to teach. When we began teaching, we didn't talk. And he would tell us not to talk. I was part of teaching what you know. And as a teacher, to learn to trust, to, to open, and to trust the work, not the words, not to feel that you had to do something, and certainly not be a teacher. Being something is crystallized. It's fitting an image. What I had to learn as a teacher was just to open and to trust for the energy to come through me. It wasn't anything that I was going to generate. The most a teacher can do is get out of the way. Rudy really got out of the way. He had a lot behind him, a lot to come through him. He would say how being a teacher or the teacher was not as important as the student. The student had to draw the work. The student had to work. The teacher has to get out of the way. So if you sit and work and draw and suck that energy, open to it, open your psychic system, use the double breath and draw it in. He, as a teacher, could do nothing but get out of the way, open respond to that. He needed that. He would speak of himself as being a cow and that he needed for us to suck on the tit. And Rudy just made himself available. As he said, none of us would ever be able to use the energy that we got just sitting for an hour with him or 10 minutes if we really drew on it. That he had a very short time with Nityananda, but he drew enough out of those few moments for a lifetime, not just a lifetime for him, but for all of us. I also asked Rudy, you know, about suffering. And I said, can't spiritual work be fun? He said, sure. Why can't spiritual work be fun? I'm inclined to make things serious or not fun. The work that we did up in Big Indian, the work that we did in, on 10th Street, and then eventually on, on uh, 13th Street, really was fun. And really what we do, if we look at it, if we have the perspective, 
of seeing it for what it is, then it is fun. When we engage in sports or competition, that's grueling. What you have to do to exercise and prepare for it and do it, and you'd say, why do you do that? Why would you go through all that work? Really because it's fun. If you have the point of view that it's fun, then it is fun. Our subjective point of view is something that we alone can control. We can choose to feel any way we want about practically anything. So often we choose to be unhappy. It's kind of crazy. What uh, special memories stand out in your mind of your time you spent with Ruby? Well, of course, one of uh, is the the last time that I spent with Rudy on this plane, in a plane. Uh, that was a very emotional and and um, I don't I don't know what the words are for it. Um, I suffered um, a lot of guilt and questioned went through hours, days, nights, years of questioning my unconsciousness. I mean, that certainly stands out. I I'm so grateful to the people around me at the time who seemed to understand so much better than I did and accept so much better than I did. That it wasn't about me. Had I been more conscious, I wouldn't have been there. I wouldn't have done it. I couldn't have done it. Had I been more conscious, Rudy wouldn't have had me there. Who was in the plane that day? Stuart, Mimi, I, and, of course, Rudy. He was dictating. When we left from Teterboro, I, he was dictating work for his second or third book. I think, actually, he was working on the third book at that time. And Mimi, who was an excellent secretary and, and uh, took down everything in shorthand, was doing that. We flew out of Teterboro. The radio didn't, I couldn't make radio contact, don't know why. Just, you know, after takeoff. And after a while, we got up um, north of Teterboro and into around Poughkeepsie area, and the fog started coming in. Um, 
And the thing to do when you get into a situation ahead of you that is blind is to do a 180 degree turn and go back. But it fogged in behind me. The next thing I could have done would be to take the plane down and find some place to land. I didn't want to do that. It was the first time that I'd taken Rudy flying. I was a green pilot. So I thought I might get above the clouds. I tried flying up and couldn't get above them. And I also realized that looking at the instruments and remembering my lessons, that I was in a spiral and I didn't know that. I mean, couldn't feel it, but I had to believe the instruments that said that's what was happening. So I pulled out of that against my sense of security in it and leveled out and then got down below the clouds and thought about putting it on the ground again and again didn't want to do that. Thought I could fly up between, <laughs> between the mountains under the fog, along the river. But then we were engulfed in clouds and Rudy had stopped dictating. He was just writing, maybe taking kind of a nap. And in the clouds, suddenly I could see land mountains on either side or ground. And what I did then, I don't know exactly. I don't know if I pushed the throttle forward, pulled it back, whatever, whatever I did. We were, it's just an instant. I just said, we're in the mountains. And next we were crashing. I think I lost consciousness for a second or two, some short time. And I was upside down in the plane. We were, the plane was upside down. And I called out. And the only answer I got was from Mimi. And so I was able to get out of the plane and then Stuart responded. And we went back and Rudy was strapped in upside down the plane. We were able to get him out, tried to I knew immediately that he was gone. Stuart didn't want to accept it and fought, tried artificial respiration, tried breathing into his mouth. And so we built a fire, spent the night, went down the next day, were able to walk down out of the mountain. And rescue teams came up later and brought Rudy down. When, when Rudy passed, or when he, he had all the teachers from ashrams all around the world, wherever they were at the time, come in and we were all together in, at the time of Rudy's passing. 
It was really a, a special time. And Rudy spoke often of his passing and how he would pass. That he would pass in an airplane crash. And um, we had all thought it was going to be a Pan Am or some kind of a big thing like that. I mean, I mean, how dense could I be <laughs> to fly him in a little plane? Um, it just never connected. Um, and actually, Michael was supposed to be on the plane. And, um, but he had something else to do, so he didn't make it. And so Mimi was able to come along. The other times that I remember, times that were with Rudy, when, when Muktananda came <laughs> and Rudy had prepared us as best he could. What a, an act of faith to open and, and let us be exposed to this. We're ready. You know, so all that we did is what brought him, you know, now it's a time to take, you know, it's a time to use him, to love him, to enjoy him, you know, it's not to be concerned and tied up and all of this thing. It's not a Jewish wedding or an Italian wedding or anything like that. <laughs> For the last minute, they're going to run him with the flowers and the caterer and show up and all this. It's ridiculous. We're not in that kind of a situation, you know, it's a time of really great happiness. And you have to approach it that way. You know, really, it's a time to really love him, you know? I mean, we've paid this, we've, you know, like we fed this turkey a long time, you know? You have to really enjoy him slice by slice. And unless you approach life that way, it really isn't worthwhile. I mean, what is it waiting and building up for something unless you're going to really enjoy it? I remember times that are in the movie when you see Rudy playing volleyball. Right. Very Kaplan killer. Put it once around the peg. And he was he was so accessible. He was always available. And we could always call him or just drop in. And he'd take care of business and, and us at the same time. He would also, as as he did with Muktananda, he would introduce us to other teachers. The only teacher who really was part or close to being part of Rudy's work was Hilda. And Hilda had, was, had studied with Nichananda and was a link to that. Rudy worked for his links. He worked for the connections. Rudy is incredibly sensitive. And, but not sensitive like getting his feelings hurt. Although he did. Um, when Muktananda came in and, and tore things apart. That was painful for Rudy. And a lot of people were torn away. Later he said, when he realized or when he opened to it that there was no amount of of money or anything or what it was worth to have that cleaned out we carry stuff in our lives that are just trash connections baggage 
and something has to come along to clean that out. It's not comfortable. But when it does happen, it's really an act of great fortune and a gift. Rudy had a lot of students and he had ashrams in how many continents? How many continents are there? <laughs> well, he had, um, Rudy traveled um, used once a year, so he would go to India, to the Orient, and buy art. He would buy big things. He would buy container loads of stuff. Um, he got it because it was too big for other people. Rather than just going over and getting knickknacks, he would buy statues and and walls and doors and, and uh, parts of buildings. And, but Rudy had tremendous energy and needed to expand that and look to expand throughout the world, not as a um, cult or, or, or power ashram. He just needed more work. He took on stuff as more work. How was Rudy different from other people that you've met? What, what was it that made him so special? That he, that he truly worked, that his, his motivation, what he said and what he did were uh, the same. And he was just totally dedicated to growth, to his own growth. And he used us for that growth. We felt used. We felt usefully used. We felt useful. We felt loved. Rudy used his mother for his growth. His mother was tough. God, she was tough. And tough, tougher on him than anybody. But like, love thy enemy, <laughs> Rudy took her into the business, had her sitting there with him, and she just never tired of, of picking on him. <laughs> and Rudy would say, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't pay anybody enough to keep doing that. And for him to work through it and to work above it and to grow. And he would complain about <laughs> how tough it was and uh, how difficult she was. Uh, and he would also say that he can say those things. It's his mother and he better not find anybody else or hear of anybody else with any disrespect for her. He protected her and, and, and took that energy, that fetching, <laughs> and used it as fuel for, her, for his growth. After Rudy passed, I saw Ray, his mother, grow into a real lady, a wonderful, um, rich person. I've come to understand that surrender is to surrender resistance. We carry such resistance. We carry such um, 
such a lot of shit, garbage. And we hold on to it like it was priceless. It is priceless. And just letting go of that is to surrender. Is there a difference between your connection with Rudy then, when he was alive, and your connection with Rudy today? It's very much like the connection that you have with someone that you love when you are in the same physical place and when you are in different physical places. If you love someone, if you have that connection, and you or that other person take a plane across the country or uh, to the next town, or you still have that connection. It's not the same as being physically in their presence. Is it less? It's in a sense different. And in a sense, it's the same, because that connection is there. And part of what Rudy did with sending people at distances was to expand the awareness of that and to recognize it. It's not out of sight, out of mind. Our connections are eternal and go beyond the bonds of the physical. Is the physical's nice. I'd love to have Rudy here. Rudy would talk about having his teachers or Nichananda would be there. Sometimes he'd be sitting right there on the couch. And I'd ask him, well, how is he on the couch? You know, what's he look like? Is he, you know, does he kind of glow? Do you kind of see through him? Or is he, I, I said, um, I mean, like, if he sits on the couch, does, does, is there a dip in the couch where, where he sits? <laughs> and he said, I don't know, he's sitting there. You know? <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, there have been times when I have uh, had the pleasure of Rudy's presence since his passing. And they are rare and wonderful, whew, rich, experiences. Um, and I certainly would prefer that, but what I have is what I have. And And it's very rich. And it has supported me for these 30 some years. And continues to support me. If I uh, bump my head, <laughs> I always say thank you, Rudy. Because it's a reminder that I'm unconscious, that I wasn't paying attention or just unaware. Rudy is very much part of my life. But he really prepared us for his passing and gave us the gift of responsibility. He didn't make us weak. I'm going to be moving to Spain, to Europe, and I'll be away from 
this class and the people and Bruce and Blanche and you, <laughs> people that I love. But I'm not going to go missing you much because I take you with me. I take Rudy with me. The w biggest thing that I recall Rudy admonishing me for is not seeing things as they are. Rudy could see things as they are. A map is not useful if it isn't the map of where you are. Once you see and know where you are, then the map can be used. Once you know and recognize and accept what is, then you can make choices. Rudy made choices, made corrections, led us, guided us, based on what really was, who we were. based on reality. First of all, not judging it, not saying it should be something else, or ignoring it as though it weren't reality. First of all, you have to see it and accept it. And then determine what it is that you want to do about it or with it. Rudy was very good at that. He ran his life that way and advised us to run ours that way. After Rudy passed, I thought of a lot of questions that I didn't ask. <laughs> but more than that is just that you know, I had the opportunity to ask and didn't. I didn't create the questions. When Bruce gives a class, when I give a class, teachers will often ask, are there any questions? Um, sometimes it's difficult. You know, sometimes the question that you had was answered. during the class. And um, more often, though, we just don't respond. We don't come out of ourselves to ask a question. We don't create the need in ourselves to ask. Rudy would admonish us for that. You, know, you need to want enough you need to go to a depth. You need to ask. You have an opportunity. You need to ask. He needed us to ask. He had so many answers. and had um, 
But unless someone asks, unless somebody has a need in themselves and opens that space for the answer, then there's no place for it to go. When I began teaching and Rudy would had said, you know, you don't proselytize, you don't try to bring people in. You can just open. And even when somebody asks to come to class or say they want to do the work or find something, you really have to listen and see if there is an emptiness in that or if it's just coming from the head. You cannot effectively answer and ask a question that comes from the head. Often people would ask questions of Rudy in, in class and he said, where's that question coming from? Can you feel where that's coming from? And usually they could. They could actually feel that it was coming from their head. Listen to people asking questions. People do a lot of chatter. Just because it has a question mark at the end of the sentence doesn't make it a question. And Rudy would also say, give what is needed, not what you need to give. If he were to give us what he had to give, what he needed to give, we would all drown. He was very sensitive to what was needed, what was asked. And not to give too much. Because Rudy had so much to give that he had to control that. There is so much life and energy around us and we only take in an infinitesimal part of it. Rudy's teaching was to open to more. To become bigger. At the time, it was in the 70s and we were marching and fighting and <laughs> getting into big causes. Well, big causes have been forever and will probably be forever or whatever that means. But we look at things from a microscopical, you know, and very subjective point of view. What's truth at one moment is not the next. What's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong. Depends on where you are and who's involved, and what the circumstances are at the time. If you're in a position of survival or protecting a family, a child, someone close, you wouldn't hesitate. And we just get up into our heads. Rudy would say, get out of your head. Recognize what is real and where you are. And from there, what you can do. If you're Gandhi, 
I mean, somehow Gandhi got to be Gandhi. And through doing what he could do personally, did what he did. I don't know that any of us are Gandhi. And so often, people get caught up in causes and put their energy there and are ignoring the things that they can do right close, what they can do for family. It's an escape. It's an easy escape, and our mind will justify it. We'll say, well, if everybody did it, this, we... See some trash? Pick it up. There are things that we can do on an immediate, personal, real level. Those are not causes. I'm saying that now. At the time, I was full of, well, but you, you, you know. <laughs> and the mind was full of all these things that were injustices. When I was at uh, UCLA for a short time and taking a philosophy course with Dr. Pyatt, and we were studying um, the Republic and, and, you know, after class we were outside on the, on the porch or, you know, these kind of university staircases with wide banisters and stairs. And, and I was leaning up against the banister behind me, kind of sitting on it like that. And we're talking about justice. And Dr. Pyatt said justice was subjective and made the example that he said, uh, if someone were to come along now behind you and just cut off your hand, one of your hands. Would that be an injustice? And my response was, I, that seems pretty obvious. <laughs> well, but if somehow you could feel that that was not an injustice, somehow you could bring yourself to feel that, then for you it would not be an injustice. Might be for 40 million other people, but for you it would not be an injustice. And if it's not an injustice for you, then for you it's not an injustice. It took me a couple of days to work with that, but it's true. Justice is subjective. And we have the choice of seeing things as we choose. We really have that choice. And we often make the choice to feel hurt or we carry on with an argument or a shit in our life. Rudy would talk about couples or somebody would get, you know, be in a conflict or they'd be fighting. And he said, just get over it. You know that in a day or two or three, you live in this home and you live with this person and you love this person and you are going to get over it. 
Now you can take two or three days or a week or a lifetime, or you can just get over it. Move on. And that's what Rudy did. Rudy was constantly moving on. Whatever he had karmically to do, he just wanted to get it done. He wanted to do everything possible in this lifetime so he didn't have to come back and do it again. That was his motivation. I mean, this is wonderful. I mean, we're here for one reason. I mean, everyone walking on the earth is here for exactly the same reason, and that's to grow up and get away from here. And this is really, it's a symbol of what happens, you know? And that's why you have to begin to love life, begin to love and be open and see everything in its positive way, because it's your capacity at birth, you know, your opportunity at birth is to transcend everything that's happened to you and go out as sweet as you came in, or much sweeter, actually, because you can completely destroy any bad karma you were born with. It's really within you. But it has to do with staying open. You can't accomplish this by being closed. And so everything is a reason to be open. Nothing is a reason to be closed. Nothing at all. That's in your own mind, this accepting and rejecting. You know? And you have to find that in your everyday. He didn't talk about what should be done. He talked about what could be done. And he focused us on what could be done. There's and he admonished us not to be shouldists. See what is, recognize it, accept it, and go from there. I would like, I would love to be able to bring you more of Rudy. I would like to be able to manifest him here. But what I can do is just be a vehicle for you to reach him or a vehicle for reaching him by opening, by getting out of the way. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I love you. Thank you. <laughs>